The central problem, it seems to me, about tourism is the one that comes up in Asia all the time. That tourism is like a fire. You can use it to cook your food or it can burn your house down. The question is, who's going to be in control of that tourism? Who's going to use it for the benefit of the local community and for the local economy? I'm making myself fairly unpopular in North Wales at the moment by asking the question, what's tourism for? Is tourism going to be used by North Wales for the benefit of people who live there? Or is North Wales going to continue to be used by tourism? Who's going to get the benefit of tourism in North Wales? Now that question, it seems to me, needs to be asked everywhere. Because if you're going to invite tourists into your community, surely you would want to make sure that you're going to be the beneficiary. You, the community, will be the beneficiary of inviting those additional feet, inviting in that ex extra sewage into your community. Why are you doing that if it's not going to bring some benefit to your community? That, for me, is increasingly the crunch question that we need to be asking around responsible tourism. Why the word responsible? I think for two reasons, really. One, we need to be holding to account the tourism industry and other people involved in bringing in tourism and saying, what are the, con what are the consequences of you choosing to make your living by bringing tourists into our community? Are we going to benefit from that as well? But the more positive frame of reference for this and we've heard it from each of the speakers in different ways so far today, is, am I going to step up to the plate? Am I going to respond to this situation by using tourism to make things better for my community? How can I do that? And all of the examples we've heard about today and the ones we're going to hear about in the rest of the day are about that. It's about responding to the issue, saying this is a problem, how do we address it? And you go back to Lincoln, who said, you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. We are definitely evading a number, as Mandu was saying this morning, a number of serious issues which we need to address. The reality is that they are not going to sort it out. We know that because we've had 50 years of them not sorting it out. If it's going to be sorted out, it's going to be sorted out by, by us. And I think one of the things that excites me about coming to Ireland each year, it's a bit like when I go down to Cornwall and I'm invited down there, I get a buzz out of being there because you meet a lot of people who are actually addressing these issues and beginning to sort them out. And we need to, to share that, um, certainly in Ireland, certainly in Cornwall, but more broadly. We need to understand that we can do it. It's also important to remember that ostriches don't um, stick their head in the sand for no reason. They do it because they need sand and pebbles in their stomachs to be able to digest the food. And I'm all for a bit of sand and pebble in the stomach to move these things on. I like the First World War poster because it seems to me that's a really important question. You know, if I was going to have grandchildren, I'm not, but if I was, what would they be saying to me about what did I do about global warming when it was becoming a serious problem? We need all to reflect on that at the personal level, but we also need to remember that the managing director of TUI also has grandchildren. He's going to be asked that question too. And we need to be asking that question all the time. What is the legacy, the consequence of what we're doing now? And the cartoon at the bottom, which Xavier, my colleague, has used a lot. You know, so, so global warming isn't really happening? What a pity. We're still going to make the world a better place. Does it really matter? The point is to try, through our work in tourism, to make the world a better place for people to live in. Now, it seems to me, <coughs> I was asked to talk about change, or I chose to talk about change. It seems to me there are two kinds of change that come up for us. The changes that we make, the things which we choose to do, the things which we feel an imperative to act about. We've heard a lot of that. But we shouldn't forget, too, that we spend most of our time responding to change. Changes in consumer demand, changes in markets and exchange rates. And the exchange rate moves, your market moves with it. Because it's suddenly very cheap for me to come to Ireland. There was a time when the pound euro exchange rate wasn't so good, I couldn't afford to come to, to Ireland. You know, it went off my list. There were other times, frankly, Paddy, where are you? When I didn't want to come to Dublin because it was full of drunken English people having a cheap weekend. So I didn't come. You make those choices, some of them of your own volition, some of them because of exchange rate that you don't completely control. Regulatory frameworks change the way in which you operate. European directives change things. And also new technology and the availability of that technology 
makes a difference, and I want to come back to that. So I think in terms of thinking about change, there's what we choose to do, and there's what we need to respond to in terms of the things that are happening. Now, if you look at the broader consumer trend, which I think is undeniably there, I pushed TUI on it yesterday, Senior Commercial Director for TUI, is demand changing for TUI? And he said, absolutely it is. People want more experiential holidays. And we shared the recollection that when I started working on tourism in 1994, tourism brochures were mostly pictures of swimming pools and bars, never with any people in them. They were always empty. But that's what you flick through. A I've still got them. Flick through a Thompson's brochure, page after page of swimming pools. I don't know why anybody ever did that, but it sold holidays back in the mid-90s. You can't sell a holiday like that now. You look at the, the publicity we see on the tables here today, it's all pictures of people doing things, having experiences in Ireland. It's a complete change. We now live in the experience economy where authenticity really matters. Authenticity because you can be caught so quickly if you've lied about what your product is. Because everybody's got a mobile phone. Anybody can go on Twitter. Anybody can share those images to destroy the image that you've created of yourself. Authenticity, I think, is undoubtedly a very strong element now in consumer desire. It's about the experience economy. It's about experience, it's about engagement in culture and community and environment. And that, of course, has to be a shared product of the tourist and of the community, of the host and the guest. There has to be quality and depth to that in order that it creates memories. I went to a local bar last night and thought, actually, I'd rather, rather be in a bar in Faversham, my hometown, where I know lots of people, or in this bar in Dublin. Because Dublin bars, if you're slightly careful about where you choose to go, Dublin bars don't let you down. They're enjoyable places to be. The crack is still there in Dublin bars in a way that it isn't in many London pubs anymore. That matters. It's part of the culture, part of the experience. And that's what drives the experience and creates the viral marketing. What am I going to talk about when I go back to Faversham? I'll certainly be talking about that pub. Great experience. And the beer. I didn't have Guinness. I had a locally brewed equivalent of Guinness. Actually, it was better. Guinness so we're going from value for money. Oh, sorry for that. I'll get shot. It's, we're going from people looking for value for money for ex to experience for money. When I was tour operating 30 years ago, I could sell three-week holidays easily. You look at UK tour operator brochures now. There are no three-week holidays on offer. It's all slid back. Two weeks, 10 days. People need to be out of the office on a Friday night and back in the office fit for work two weeks later. You're driving it down to 10 days on the ground by the time you take the travel out. So people are traveling for shorter periods of time. They're wanting more experience for the money. And that's part of the advantage of Ireland, of course, in relation to the UK market. It's close, although, as Mandy would point out to me, it's only close if you fly. Um, and I, I wear my sockcloth sock cloth and ashes, Mandy, for having flown here. I put these up, partly because they're really old now. 1999, good grief, why am I showing you data from 1999? Because we don't collect this anymore. <coughs> why don't we collect this anymore? Because we don't need to. Why don't we need to? I don't think there's a tour operation in the UK who doesn't believe this. It's over. No point in doing the research anymore. We don't need to research it. UK tour operators know that people sure want to be able to afford the holiday. Surprising if you live in the UK, they want good weather. But look at the other things. They want things, all of which are above used the company before. That was dynamite when this came out. Suddenly people realised the fact you'd travelled with them before wasn't as important to these consumers as having ethical policies or having designed it to have low impact on the environment. And that's way back in 1999. Look at something completely different in terms of market trends. This is co-op. Well, it's a bit odd, isn't it? The co-op and, co and ethical these days. But nonetheless, the co-op does ethical research been doing it every couple of years for years. Extraordinary. People feel guilty. Look at that. Felt guilty about an unethical purchase. 31% in 2012. Actively sought information on a company's reputation. 33%. Avoided products or services based on the company's responsible reputation. 50%. Chose product or service on the basis of responsible reputation. 50%. Recommended a company on the basis of a responsible reputation. 41%. 
Now, you tell me any company that can afford to ignore that percentage. Might not be a majority, but you can't afford to ignore those percentages of your consumers. Now, the question, I think, for businesses is, is there an advantage in, be, in being the first mover? Is there an advantage in being a leader in this field? Or is it better to, as I, as I think Mary might have been suggesting earlier, I'd be interesting to debate this with you, Mary, is there some advantage in actually waiting until a few other people have done it and experimented and picking up? Well, the Japanese would say absolutely yes. You look at their whole technological development, it's been based upon that. But on the other hand, if you are a leader, you get that advantage of being first mover. And what I would say is that in each of the examples we've heard about today, people have talked about the company or the council, but actually it's always about individuals. It's never. Companies don't make decisions. They're not capable of it. it the decisions are made by individuals in boardrooms. The dynamics of the group of decision makers is important, but look at this first user advantage. This campaign by Marks and Spencers in Britain originated with a small group of managers who got worried about what Marks and Spencers were doing. It slowly worked through the company, became a dominant part, part of, not the whole, but a part of rescuing a British brand which looked, frankly, as though it's going to go to the wall. Plan A because there is no plan B. There is no alternative but to do these things. And now even Tesco's and Asda and all the others are saying things that they're doing in a similar kind of way. That's leadership. People like me don't forget that it was Marks and Spencers that began that in the UK. I'm often asked, what is the business case for responsible tourism? To which the answer is, there is no business case. It's plural. There are different reasons. That board table that you're talking to, that boardroom, it's got a range of different people in there who will respond for different reasons. The CEO is quite likely to be in favour of minimising risk and getting a licence to operate. The product managers are concerned about quality. The accountants are worried about cost savings. The human resources are worried about staff morale. And the marketeers are after market advantage around the experience, around the differentiation and the PR, around reputation, referral and repeats. That's what we all know. We all say the most important marketing person you have are your former customers who come back or who encourage others to come. We all say that all the time. But that's about being different from the others. And to be different, I think you need to be a leader, and there is first mover advantage. Which brings me to social media and technology. It seems to me that really we make a lot of fuss about something which amplifies gossip. That's what the social media does. I'm an active player on Facebook and on Twitter. What's it all about? It's basically it's gossip. It's that good old stuff that actually runs human societies. But what the social media has done is allow us to amplify it. And that's a massive threat because you cannot not be on social media. Even if you're not there, other people will be on social media talking about you. And TripAdvisor will go and create a whole business out of talking about you, whether you want to be on TripAdvisor or not. So you can't not be in the social media anymore, any more than you could avoid being gossiped about if you lived in Faversham or worked at Leeds Beckett. There's going to be gossip. You can't avoid it. The negative comment, though, is now multiplied by social media massively. But there's also an opportunity. It's never been cheaper to maintain relationships with your previous customers. You don't any longer have to print off a letter, put it in an envelope, stick a stamp on it, put it in the post. It's just an email. 11,000 people last night got an email from me about responsible tourism. I could never have done that without the development of the internet. That's a really empowering thing to be able to do. Communication is cheaper. Negative comment can be re refuted. You can get repeats and referrals off the social media. Now, what do successful, social de successful tourist destinations have? It seems to me they have something unique. And that came through very powerfully. You'll be able to see it on the web soon. Gary Wilson, commercial director at TUI, being interviewed by, by me yesterday saying three things, basically. Destinations which forget their USPs will, in the end, decline. He constantly gets people asking him about seasonality and extending length of stay. But the answer to that is simply to have a better product that you can access at more times of the year. And in terms of Ireland, there's that um, very successful marketing campaign being run by one of the outdoor wear organisations, basically saying there's no bad weather, there's just bad climate. 
I've just come back from Kerala. They constantly talk about the monsoon as the off season. And yet there is no better time in my view to be in Kerala than during the monsoon and to experience a monsoon is something which very few people who don't live in a country that has a monsoon have the experience of. The winter in Ireland, I know, because I've been here, can be stunning. You don't have to sell it as the off season. It's just different. It's definitely based upon partnerships and collaboration. That's a fundamental part of it. I think the opportunities are around authenticity. The threats, though, energy, global climate change, waste, water, pollution, resource costs, and reputation. And look at three, which are going to be big issues in UK outbound tourism. Child protection. This tendency for people just to turn the other way. People are going to get caught now on that. Turning the other way will not do. People expect better. Heightened awareness in the UK because of the paedophilia cases, which are coming through almost daily now um, in the UK. I'm told it's going to get worse between now and the election. Just one case after another. Very heightened awareness going to come of that. Children not being tourist attractions. It's absolutely the case that taking tourists to orphanages is going to become something that you just don't do anymore. And that's going to happen very quickly because of the cases that we're seeing of tourism demand having generated orphans. And similarly, I think one that's going to come up very much in the general election campaign in the UK, the very big problem of wages in the travel and tourism industry, particularly central London hotels who are not paying the living wage, meaning that I, as a, if I were a London ratepayer, but me as a taxpayer, I am subsidising the wages of people who are cleaning hotel rooms in central London for which they're charging £250 a night and we think paying about £3 to clean the room. There's something wrong about that. And politically, that is going to come out um, in the washing. Reputational risk in all of those areas for UK tourism businesses. I wanted to end by asking you, on behalf of Ireland, but on behalf of yourselves and, behind, and on behalf of the Responsible Tourism Movement, to get yourselves nominated for the World Responsible Tourism Awards. Cavan did it last year. I'd like to see a lot more Irish competition for these awards. You can never know who's going to win because you don't know who else is going to be in the categories each year. But there's no doubt about it in my mind that the examples you're going to see in the awards later today, many of those could have won over the last few, few years in the World Responsible Tourism Awards. But to win, you have to be in. And to get in, you have to get yourself nominated and fill in the forms. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you.